Hello, Penguin Lord, Sign the Baby Penguin, and welcome back to Kerbal Space Program Endurance! Coming out slightly more often now. Still not very often. I'm still doing exams, so don't get your hopes up yet. Kerbal Rising is on the way. I haven't started making it yet, but exams are almost done. Almost done! So close! Oh my god! Okay, so, anyway, today we are actually launching our very first Solitude Space Station, which is... Kind of weird, because we have space stations around Guardian and Nemesis, the two moons of Solitude, and we have a surface base on the surface of Nemesis, yet we haven't launched a single station just around Solitude. And the reason for that is just because we haven't got any decent contracts to do so. And we have also haven't really needed one, but we're going to be launching quite a lot of deep space missions in the future, so we're probably going to need to build some kind of orbital construction yard, and that is what this is. Thea Station! which is some kind of Greek deity. I don't know, I looked it up at the time of recording and I've completely forgotten how it's remotely related. But in order to construct a lot of rockets and do research and all sorts, it's going to need a lot of power. So we've got some uh, Gigantor solar arrays there, which can also receive beamed power. I think in sometime in the future we might want to set up some kind of beamed microwave power relay. Um, because with Archangel being as bright as it is, solar power is kind of overpowered in uh, <laughs> in the After Kerbin planet pack. So we could set up some solar stations, maybe a little bit closer to Archangel, and beam the power back in the form of microwaves. That could be pretty freaking awesome. We should have unlimited power on all of our spacecraft on the inner solar system. So that, should, that could be something interesting to do uh, in future episodes. But sure enough, we reuse the uh, first stage and of course the boosters of our rocket. I don't know when we're going to retire this rocket but we will do it at some point and uh, we get our space station into a really really circular orbit uh, which I was quite proud of until I then fire the booster back into the atmosphere which abruptly offsets the uh, the orbit quite a lot but I was I was proud of it initially but uh, anyway we're not just sending that station up on its own we also need to send up a little spacecraft to do act as a sort of a tug uh, because we get a lot of low solitude orbit uh, contracts but None of them really pay enough to justify sending a mission on their own, but together they're pretty worthwhile. We get a lot of rescue contracts and a lot of salvage contracts, so we're sending up a basically a little, little, a little space tug to uh, go dock onto the station. And when we have things to do in low solitude orbit, we'll just use it. It's got a lot of delta v because it's got a nuclear engine. It's quite small, quite lightweight, and it's got a bunch of Kerbal attachment system supplies on it as well. So it should be relatively useful. We've only actually got one Kerbal on the station because. We do not need another research lab. Um, we have, I think, three operational research labs right now and an extra one on uh, Talos 1 around Guardian. But uh, we do kind of need, as I said, a presence in low solitude orbit. So yeah, just the one Kerbal to conserve supplies. Um, and to stop him going insane, we do actually have some habitation things on uh, Thea Station. But just to make him stay up there for as long as possible, uh, the class of Kerbal that we've sent up is actually a Scout, which is a type of Kerbal that USI colonization adds. Uh, and Scouts are essentially just really good at staying in space for a really, really long time. That's that's all they're good at. Um, so he's going to be up there alone for an extended period of time. Um, hopefully he won't go insane and stage a mutiny like the uh, the Skylab crew did that one time. Although apparently it wasn't even mutiny. You get like conflicting sources as to whether they turned their radios off intentionally or whether they were actually given a day off. Um, but hey, you know. Usually the story is much better than the actual truth. I don't know if I'm more about a good story or the truth, I don't know, I sound more like a, I sound kind of like a press journalist. I, th I don't know what, <laughs> what other kind of journalist is there. Anyway, so we used our slightly larger launch stage, um, of course using those vector engines, and this time we actually left a full fuel tank at the bottom of it, so we can use three engines to slow ourselves down, maintain control using those air brakes, and we actually save all the engines. So we pretty much perfected this massive launch stage now. Uh, so we should be able to launch much, much heavier payloads. This thing can get, I think, about 70 tons into low solitude orbit. So pretty nice for being fully reusable. Anyway, so we finally arrive at Fear Station and we deploy our tug. You're probably wondering, though, Beardy, the tug is like the top tiny piece of the giant spacecraft, the giant 70 ton spacecraft that you just launched into low solitude orbit. What the hell is the other piece for? Well, we'll explain that in a minute, but right now we're just making our approach to Thea Station. We do actually have a couple of uh, communications blackouts while we were uh, doing this rendezvous. I sort of cut them all out so you don't really notice, but um, 
We really should put a better communications network up. The last time we launched communications satellites was um, when we were still launching Frontier shuttle missions, uh, which I, I guess we've kind of retired the space shuttle now, mainly just because shuttle missions take so much longer to do, um, <laughs> and I have less time to record these episodes. Um, they were a lot of fun at the time, though. But you just get so little done. Like, you dedicate a whole episode to a shuttle mission. That's like the whole episode. So little gets done. I do actually kind of want to go interstellar in this series at some point and colonize um, another solar system. And that's something you might actually notice in the background. We've got this uh, object enhancement finally working with other star systems. So you may actually be able to see um, a red star in the sky. Just a little hint for you there. Anyway, so on to what we're actually doing with this spacecraft. As I said, we get a lot of contracts for low solitude orbit, but none of them really add up to justify sending a mission there. However, we have three very lucrative salvage contracts for low solitude orbit. Three components, which, all of which are quite heavy, quite large, uh, and we need to return those back to the surface of solitude for a pretty decent payout. So, I'll admit we did really overbuild this. Like, I used a lot of fuel um, doing these rendezvous just because we had so much fuel in this spacecraft and we kind of needed to burn it all off before we re-entered. Um, yeah, but I mean, we had the capable launch stage. And this is getting reused anyway. The launch stage got reused. So really, it doesn't really cost us much um, to overbuild things nowadays because our rockets are reusable. So, you know, and actually, if we launch, uh, I think it's... 40 tons into low solitude orbit, we get a bonus of 40,000 funds from our uh, strategy. Um, extra, I think it's super scale launches or whatever the, whatever it is. Um, so it's actually certainly worthwhile launching large things into orbit. But we grab our first component, which was actually spinning. Uh, I was a bit worried I'd have to do an interstellar sort of docking scene. And I do love the music to that scene so much. The dun 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 dun. dun. I used to jam to that when that film first came out. I kind of had an unhealthy obsession with Interstellar. Looking back at it objectively, I don't think it's actually that great a film, but I did really love it uh, <laughs> at a point in time. But uh, our next piece of equipment is a giant communications dish, which is takes a little bit more effort uh, to get into the cargo bay. We have to sort of jiggle it about a bit to actually get the claw to grab it. But uh, sure enough, we get it and we've just got one more component to go head over and grab. So, you guys, I've I'm completely changing topic at this point in time, but a lot of you people have been like, Beardy, why are your exams lasting so long? What's going on? So, a lot of you don't even know what A-levels are as well. <laughs> that's that's, uh, that's something, but I just, you know, I've got two more exams this week and then it's finished. Then we're all done. I've got a cadet camp, but then probably back to video making schedule besides my holiday. Um, so... Kerbal Rising and everything is not going to be regular because tape's working in Ireland. Um, but my video schedule should get back to normal relatively soon. So, fingers crossed, get excited. Anyway, um, uh, back to the actual thing that's going on. For some reason, the third component is a giant laser. Um, yeah, I don't know why that's in the mod pack. Uh, <laughs> I think it might be for power transmission, so like I said earlier, beaming microwave power um, across the solar system. But yeah, so for some reason we're recovering a, just a giant laser beam from space. Not entirely sure whose laser beam it is, or who's paying us to recover it, or why it's in space, but you know, um, <laughs> I'm not going to ask too many questions, as long as they're paying, you know. We're doing some really shady stuff over the last three episodes, haven't we? It's all about saving up money for that uh, that demise mission, which is upcoming. Hopefully, probably not ne not next episode, but the ne the episode after, we will be building the spacecraft and heading off. Uh, the transfer window is arriving pretty soon, which is why we're doing all these essentially just sort of crappy little missions, uh, just to try and build up as, um, as much of a stockpile of funds as we can. Because once we send that mission to Demise, we're just going to be rolling in funds. With all our strategies giving us money when we transmit science from new biomes and celestial bodies and everything, we are going to get a serious return of funds uh, when we launch that mission to Demise. Like Once we land, plant that flag and return all those science experiments, we're just going to be set. Probably not for science, but we'll have to send some more interplanetary missions. And I do want to send one. I'll probably use the same spacecraft, to be honest. Um, I'll use, I do want to send one to the wasteland, back to Kerbin, and go check out the old destroyed uh, Kerbal Space Center. That could be pretty freaking awesome. 
But anyway, we land and we get our wonderful return of funds just fine. And now we're heading back to the Werner Space Telescope. And I was talking about how I was stockpiling funds and about how the reason why we have no funds is because Research Bodies charges us 750,000 funds every single time we discover a new celestial body with this telescope. And a lot of you agreed with me that was just kind of dumb. Um, yeah, I didn't think to check the research body difficulty settings. I didn't realize that was what the settings did. Just make it impossible to research anything because it costs so much. And when you're on the higher difficulty settings and you don't get any money from anything, that combines to make things really, really grindy. So I just turned off the uh, the cost. I keep sort of cheaping out in this in this series, don't I? I upped the, uh, the fund returns and now I'm turning off the research body's cost. But I kind of want this series to progress and actually go somewhere, not just me grinding. Um, so, uh, what we're doing is we're using the Space Telescope just to scale over the last two planets in the Kerbal system. The first one was Eltos, what has now become of Elu. And the second one is Drez. Or, well, now it's called Drizzen. But look, it actually exists! Drez exists, everybody, and it's got a moon now. Look at that. If it has a moon, then clearly it has to actually exist. Because you can't fake Drez landings on the moon when Drez itself has a moon. That's going to... Oh, there's so many jokes there. Okay, if we ever send a mission to Drez, which I don't think we ever will because it doesn't exist. But if we do, that's going to... I have to think of a lot of jokes for that. Anyway, so on to our final mission for today. As you probably remember, or probably don't, last episode, we spotted a killer asteroid, which is only really Class C. But there is an asteroid on a course to collide with Solitude. And so what we're going to do is send a mission to redirect it. Not so much because it's going to hit the ground and do a lot of damage. It's really a tiny asteroid. It will almost certainly burn up in the atmosphere. But we are getting paid a hell of a lot to do it. And as you know, I love that sweet, sweet dollar. So that's exactly what we're going to do. We named the spacecraft rather appropriately. We named it Prometheus because we're stealing from the gods. I mean, Prometheus stole fire from the gods and gave it to humanity. We're redirecting a cold lump of space rock and sending it to Guardian to get paid. But... You know, <laughs> potato, potato. Yeah, I thought it was a cool name anyway. Um, and this is actually kind of similar, I guess, to the asteroid redirect mission that NASA were going to do. They were going to intercept an asteroid, put it into orbit around the moon, then send a manned mission to go investigate a said asteroid, take samples, etc. I don't think they're doing that anymore. No, that's that's cancelled. Like the whole reason all the asteroid redirect parts got added to KSP was because of uh, the collaboration between NASA and the KSP devs. Because the redirect mission was happening, but it's not happening anymore because NASA just has no focus. And that's not NASA's fault. That's because just four year administrations, every administration, it's like, we should go to the moon. Oh, no, we should go to Mars. No, we should go back to the moon. No, wait, no, Mars. And I think at the moment it's build a space station around the moon and use that to go to Mars. Even though a space station around the moon, just there is no reason to have it. It's so much cheaper to go straight to Mars than go to the moon, stop, and then continue to Mars. People like people are like, oh, it's like a gas station halfway. No, no, it's not. It's it's like taking a a massive detour, like a, a thousand kilometer detour to go to a gas station when you could have just gone straight there and you ended up you end up using more fuel. <laughs> okay, um, it's a terrible analogy. And it's kind of a pointless space station. But yeah, okay, I'm not going to start ranting about that. But you know, Elon Musk going to Mars, so I guess it's all alright. Anyway, so the thing about Solitude uh, is that it, it's tidally locked to Archangel, the sun. So we had to launch at a pretty stupid inclination to even get something close to what this asteroid is heading in at. It's heading in in a retrograde orbit at something like... 70 degrees of inclination or just something insane um so yeah i really underbuilt this spacecraft i had no idea just how much fuel it was going to take to a intercept this asteroid and b actually redirect it uh, and get it into orbit of guardian and as you see we're having to do some pretty insane maneuvers here uh, we are getting some nice views of solitude though i've never i don't think i've ever actually launched anything into polar orbit of solitude before yeah, we, we just had no reason to launch something into polar orbit before. Um, and this is close to polar orbit. So we get a nice view of the aurora, which is, it's pretty sweet, actually. It's pretty nice. This is why I do like asteroid redirect missions, because you just go into just 
insane orbits that you would just never go into otherwise, um, which is certainly interesting. And as you see, we finally get our alarm and the killer asteroid has entered the system, except it's not really a killer asteroid. It's really quite tiny. But just look at that. Look at the difference in distance that we're traveling. We're going like a tiny portion of our orbit and it's going all the way into the system. It shows you just how fast this thing's going. We're going to have to do a pretty hefty burn to actually intercept with it and catch it up. And this is the most expensive thing about asteroid intercepts is just matching velocity with them because they're traveling in usually at such high velocities. I've got a fair few of you have probably seen the film Armageddon uh, and in that film they use the moon to gravity essentially slingshot around the back of the moon um, and then that's how they manage to catch up with the asteroid without using too much fuel. One of the very few like scientifically plausible parts of that film. Uh, we do actually burn to make sure that our path is still essentially on a collision course with solitude so that we ditch that stage and that stage is going to enter the atmosphere and crash. So we are sort of minimizing our uh, the amount of space junk we're leaving. But finally it's in sight and the killer. Oh, no it's still not a killer asteroid. It's, st <laughs> it's like yeah uh, it's like the size of maybe a small house. It's not really very dangerous, but it's going to be quite interesting. We should get some science and we'll probably name it something cool in the next episode. Thank you very much for watching everyone. I've been the Beardy Penguin and I'll see you all next time.